Well, while everybody is coming in, welcome uh, to the DC Archaeology webinar. We're so excited that you're here today. Uh, my name is Shay Corey, and I serve as the programs manager for the DC Preservation League. I'm joined today by our fabulous speaker, uh, Dr. Ruth Tricoli, and my coworker, Zachary Burt, who's helping run uh, our Facebook live stream. For those of you who may be new to DCPO, we are Washington, D.C. citywide nonprofit founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of the nation's capital. So I have just a few things to go over before we get started. And first, I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors, whose annual financial support helps underwrite free programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, QTAC Rock, Douglas Development Corporation and Tunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Robert Benson Photography, Fire Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, Edens, EHT Traceries Inc., KCE Structural Engineers, Quinn Evans, and David Schwartz Architects. Thank you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. Moving on, we have a few notes on how today's webinar is going to run. So if you have a question, uh, please use the Q&A box, which is found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions and we'll go through them uh, towards the end of the program. For those joining us on Facebook, Zach will be monitoring any questions you might have and sending them our way over here on Zoom. And uh, those are all of our housekeeping items. So now that we've covered those, I'm so pleased to introduce you all to today's speaker, Dr. Ruth Tricoli. Uh, she's the District Archaeologist for Washington, D.C. in the Historic Preservation Office, Office of Planning. Uh, she was a 2015 winner of the Morris and Gwendolyn K. Fritz Foundation Award for Exemplary Public Service and a 2016 Society for Historical Archaeology Award of Merit uh, for her work in the district. Her prime goals are to identify, record, and protect the district's archaeological resources. Her duties include reviewing federal and local, local construction projects, maintaining the archaeological site files, curating the archaeological collections and technical report library, and conducting public outreach. She received her doctorate from the University of Florida in anthropology with a specialty in North American archaeology and a BA from Douglas College, Rutgers University in classic or classical archaeology. Uh, Dr. Tricoli has been employed as a professional archaeologist since completing her undergraduate degree. She previously worked in the private sector as a consulting archaeologist in academia and as a contractor at the Smithsonian Institution, National Museum of National History. And with that, I'm so excited to turn things over uh, to her. I think it's going to be a really great talk, and uh, I'm really excited that she's here today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to explain how we do archaeology in Washington, D.C., what my job is, and how we fit into the bigger preservation picture. Uh, it's unusual uh, for me to participate in things like HPRB and D.C. Preservation League things because archaeology is not at the top of most people's minds. But um, it is my goal to change that and to make you aware of the importance of archaeology in the district and how we manage resources, how we determine archaeological potential, how we uh, curate the archaeological collections, and lots of other things that have to do with archaeology. Um, I am accompanied today by Christine Ames, the assistant archaeologist. She's here as the backup. And we will um, jump into our PowerPoint. Uh, okay. All right. Is that working? Oh, is that working? Yeah, it's loading. There it is. Did I share the correct page? Um, it's not full screen. Um, for, or maybe it's the other one. The other. Right. I may have shared the wrong page. Sorry <laughs> about that. I did this right in the practice session. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Perfect. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, well, as you can see, I'm with the Office of Planning in the Historic Preservation Office. And um, let's see. So the Historic Preservation Office isn't technically um, separate from the Office of Planning, but we do a lot of different things that are not planning per se. 
Um, the mission of the Historic Preservation Office is to identify, evaluate, and protect and enhance historic properties. And those historic properties include archaeological resources. And that is my ballywick. So what is archaeology? It's the study of the past through material remains. That's the artifacts, the features, architectural remains of previous occupants. Uh, historic archaeology is the subset of archaeology that deals when you have written records uh, or oral traditions. Now, not all historical period archaeology uh, has records. There are people that aren't documented in records very well. Uh, enslaved uh, children, women oftentimes completely escape historical record. So archaeology is one way we can tell stories about the past when there aren't documentary records or whether there are because the uh, records tend to be biased. They're kept by the people in power. They're written about the stories that they want to tell from their perspectives. Um, Native American archaeological sites are one way we can tell the stories about the past for the Native American segment of the population. But we are storytellers and we offer different perspectives about the past. Archaeological data can be considered a parallel source of information. And so it can be very powerful. Uh, the role of archaeology in the Historic Preservation Office is for, uh, as the archaeologist, as the district archaeologist, I ensure that the archaeological sites are identified. Potential archaeological resources are considered um, under the National um, Register, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, rather. They're considered important until they are either defined as eligible or not eligible. So we have to take that into account. Uh, we don't get to review all projects in the district. We're very specifically limited, and I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, we work at both the federal and the local level through very specific review processes that have regulations. And we determine whether sites are eligible or likely to yield information important in history and prehistory. Now that you see the quotes on the slide, and that is very specific. That is tied to the laws that govern archaeology. Um, I'm going to skip a slide here and get into that. Oh, um, wait, my slides aren't advancing, yeah. are they? <laughs> it was just about to ask. Yeah, they aren't changing. All right, so you're seeing it there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm uh, confused. No, you're good. But there we go. Okay, <laughs> you've got my mission. Yay! <laughs> and this is what archaeology is. And you see some, uh, you see the text that I, I brought up and uh, some of our different public projects. We tell stories and we can do that at different levels to children, adults, amateurs, professionals, history buffs, you name it. Uh, some images of some of our other projects, both our own, our outreach, and, and projects that are funded by development. This is a, a image, uh, an 1834 painting, and it was engraved and it shows the district in 1834. Very pastoral and, and soft and evocative, but it does show you that it, for a good period of history, the district was partly rural. You had the city in the center, and then you had it surrounded by the county of Washington and farms. And uh, pre-Civil War, there were estates essentially where there were enslaved people. So archaeology encompasses all of these different time periods, the city, the urban, the former farms, Native American history, the location of the city at the fall line. If you just go up the Potomac River a bit, you'll hit the falls of the Potomac. That means the district straddles two different environmental zones, the Piedmont above the falls 
and the outer, uh, the inner coastal plain below the falls. And so that uh, each area is typified by different vegetation and animals. So straddling that line makes the different makes the district located in a very rich ecotone with access to resources from both areas. So even in the native earliest Native American times, Paleo-Indian period, this would have been a locus of settlement. There was always water flowing here from both the Anacostia and the Potomac River. So it was always a place to be. And it was a center, if you will, even though it straddles these different ecological zones. Now, I've mentioned the laws a couple of times already, and the two main driving laws for the whole Historic Preservation Office system, and uh, my position there, is the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. It establishes the Section 106 review process, the SHPO system, or the State Historic Preservation Office system. Um, DC, while not being a state, does have a state historic preservation office, as do a few of the territories, the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam. And that is the review office that many of you are familiar with that uh, has the responsibility of reviewing projects that are federally funded, federally permitted, or are on, or are on federal property. So, since the 25% of the district is federally owned or managed, that means we review a huge number of Section 106 projects. Every construction project involving ground disturbance on those federal properties is technically a Section 106 undertaking. Uh, and that's the language of that the law requires. And uh, I review all of those projects. And let me tell you, there's a lot. We do more Section 106 than some states do because we have so many federal agencies and so much federal property here. And these projects that require these permits would include HUD projects or Army Corps projects in the rivers, any project on federal land, but also those that are federally funded such as uh, HUD grants for building affordable housing, uh, anything that requires EPA review. So there's a whole industry, we call it cultural resources management, and that's the firms that employ archeologists to do this review work. And if studies are needed, archeological investigations, uh, that uh, they are the people in those firms that would be doing that work. Now, we also have a local law that applies, the district's historic landmark, uh, historic landmark and Historic District Protection Act of 1978. And in 2006, that was amended to include archaeological review of district-owned properties. And because of that, uh, we do a lot of review work for renovations to public schools, district parks and other district properties, uh, Department of Public Works, uh, or things like that, all DDOT projects. Uh, so we are very busy. Keep my finger on the um, slide advance key so I do this correctly. Uh, so there are uh, very many historic resources in the district. As you can see here, uh, th these numbers are a little out of date, but as of 2016, there were 26,000, almost 27,000 historic properties. Now, many of those are individual houses in historic districts, of which we have over 64 at this point, 709 landmarks, uh, lots of National Register listed properties, and uh, many national historic landmarks, a large concentration of landmarks. And they are the highest category of historic property listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Things like St. Elizabeth's Hospital, uh, the, the um, Lincoln's Cottage up in the Armed Forces Retirement Home, really important landmarks that have the highest status of, of historic uh, 
de designation and also protection. We have over 500 archaeological sites and over 800 individual archaeological assessments or surveys that have been conducted. Many of these are only at the phase 1A or just a desktop review or just involve geoarchaeological coring, which I'll describe that a little bit later. But not every one is uh, what you see on TV as a dig. We have some uh, levels of research that need to be done before you move into that more intensive level where you dig. So the district is intensively urbanized and developed. Even though you have a place like Rock Creek Park, which looks like old growth forest, it is not. It has been clear cut more than once. There were farms and estates there. There were people growing wine grapes. It uh, so don't be fooled just because you see a forested area. We're just densely developed and constantly changing. Every time you build a building, you're digging things up, and there probably was a building there in the past. Uh, as you can see from some of these images, often in order to get down to a surface where you have an archaeological site, you have to go through fill. This upper left is a good example of that. You, there may be so much fill, you may need a backhoe. And these bottom examples are really extreme examples. Um, the one on the right, the intact archaeological site was over 30 feet below the ground surface. And they're building a, a sewage treatment facility. And in order to get down to the level that they needed to build their building on, the semi-subterranean, they had to build essentially big retaining wall coffer dam. And the archaeologists then were able to get in there at 25 feet below the ground surface and start the archaeology. And I'll tell you what, we knew there would be a site there. We weren't guessing because in the geoarchaeology, they pulled up a four inch core and there were Native American sherds, prehistoric pottery. So we knew from the get go that that project was going to require more intensive archaeology. So uh, I'm going to give you a little more on what we do before I get into uh, the little, some people would call it the sexier archaeology. But the bread and butter of what I do is compliance review. We review these construction projects to determine if they're going to need archaeology. Is there archaeological potential? Who lived there in the past and would they have left archaeological remains behind? We apply the regulations and we also monitor the projects. We approve the work plans. Uh, no one can do archaeology without preparing a work plan that gets approved. Uh, this is part of our compliance aspect of the project. Everything needs to be standardized. They need to agree that they're going to write a report, and the report has to meet the guidelines. Um, the data management, th these reports are generated. There's um, electronic data. There are photos and field notes. Uh, there are sites that are identified, so there are site forms that have to be filled out. So we maintain the site file library. The GIS, the GIS or Geographic Information System is how we manage all this information and know whether these projects will require archaeology. And the map here shows uh, in with the red locations where Section 106 surveys have been conducted. Now we could overlay the um, parkland on this map, and they are almost correlate one to one because. So much of the property is owned by the Park Service or DC Parks that those properties will all require our review and often archeological survey. But you can also see some other areas, for example, Bowling Air Force Base. I'm, I'm gonna move my cursor and I think you can see that. Can you see that? So we have a big series of federal facilities down here. The Sewage Treatment Plan, Naval Research Lab, and Bowling Air Force Base. So there's a large concentration of federal and district property. So you see there's been a large amount of survey. In the downtown and, and core of the city, national parks are all over the place. So we've seen a lot of survey on those properties. 
they're building new buildings on the National Mall for the Smithsonian. Those again would require our review and oftentimes archeology. span These projects generate collections, artifacts, excavation records, photos, documents. So we curate all those materials. And finally, uh, one of the most fun aspects of our job um, is to do education and outreach. Things like this talk, our summertime Day of Archaeology Festival, uh, Anacostia River Festival, and a variety of other outreach events that we participate in. We visit schools and we work with the Urban Archaeology Corps and um, do things like that. We give talks at professional conferences. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do education and outreach. Now, I had already mentioned the GIS or Geographic Information System, and this map shows um, where some archaeological sites are in the district. And it's um, we use this kind of map in our work to identify whether a location has potential or not. Now, note that many of the dots are concentrated near the rivers. And that is because much of the parkland in the city is along the rivers, the Anacostia Riverwalk Trail, the Potomac River CNO Canal. So there has been a lot of work in those locations. There are also highways there, uh, bridges and other public facilities. Uh, we already mentioned bowling and Naval Research Lab, those kind of places. Uh, now the three colored dots on this map show historic sites multi-component sites that have both historic and prehistoric resources present. And then the red dot or the blue dots are uh, pr solely prehistoric sites. And what you can see from this is in areas like Georgetown and the center core of the city, there are primarily historic sites. That is, the core of the, the city, the original federal city is where the earliest development was in the district. And that has re been rebuilt and redeveloped multiple times over now. Um, some properties have seen four or five phases of development, while others may still have the original historic building present. Um, the prehistoric sites tend to be located outside the center core because those areas are least developed. Think of Potomac River Gorge and the CNO Canal. Um, the, the shorelines, and um, there are the places where we are more likely to find prehistoric resources in those less developed areas. Now, we manage this information in the GIS, and each one of those points you saw in the previous map, and each one of these polygons, which is these funky shaped things, um, is in the GIS and is backed by a table of data. So we call these attribute tables. And these survey polygons here are color-coded by survey type. We have our standard archeological categories here, phase 1A survey, phase two data recovery. And each one of these is it indicates a different level of intensity. And the lowest level is a phase 1A that's just a historical desktop review. A phase one intensive survey, for example, includes some level of, of walkover survey or geoarchaeology. And that's the first level that we typically deal with. Now, if you look at the data table, you can see the different categories that are symbolized here are indicated in a column. You have the site or the project area description, for example, the old civic center. Those of you that have been here for a while will recognize that as the Comcast Center. It was demolished 10 or 15 years ago, and we now have the arena gallery place, right? So that's where the caps used to play. At any rate, um, this data table goes on and on well beyond what is shown here, but it includes aspects of, of the survey. What 
law mandated the work, the project, the firm that conducted it, and the report number. And the report number is what we use to identify, to key these survey polygons to the data table. And that's what we also, um, that there are the reports that are generated by previous survey. So what do we do with all this information? Well, I'm going to give you an example of a project. This is the Walter Pierce Park. Those of you that uh, listened to last month's um, talk by Mary Belcher will be familiar with Walter Pierce Park. It's a city park, well-loved, Adams Morgan. But the park has a history. So this is what the park area looked like in 1888. This is a historic topo map or topographic survey map. And those lines are topographic elevations. You can see this one over here is 40 feet above uh, whatever they were defining as the baseline elevation datum, uh, usually sea level or something akin to that. The closer the lines are, the steeper the slope. So the Calvert Street Bridge would run here. And if you're down at the Rock Creek level and you look up, the bridge is a good 100 feet above your head. So this is a very steep slope indeed. The pink outline shows the park. But notice on the map that this area was a cemetery in 1888. It was Mount Pleasant Plains, um, the Colored Union Benevolent Association Cemetery. It was operated for 20 years in the post-Civil War period and was primarily a place where the new residents to the district that were formerly enslaved, that were part of the associations, were interred. When the cemetery was founded, this area, as you can see from this map, was not very highly developed. There are very few houses around here. When you look at the area today, it's a different story. Adams Morgan is packed. If you've ever tried to find a parking space on a Friday night to go out to dinner, you can't do it. it uh, these uh, dense row houses and apartment buildings all over the place. Now, this park was created from the former cemetery grounds because around um, the, the late 19th century, as this neighborhood began to build out, people complained that it was insanitary. And basically, the formerly enslaved people that founded this cemetery were squeezed out by affluent uh, people that did not want this community in their neighborhood. So um, the district has a very checkered past in this, in this regard. And this is not the only cemetery that was treated like this. So at any rate, what happened is they condemned the ground. The zoo bought part of the, of the former cemetery property here and removed some of the burials. And eventually the property became, uh, uh, the, the property was owned by a developer. And in the 1940s, they attempted to clear the ground to start building a, an apartment building here on Adams Mill Road. And they encountered burials. And the burials that they disturbed in that project are now at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum. But they realized at that time that when the cemetery was closed, they really did not set up a process for them to remove the burials. And so many were left in place, many, many. And there were over 9,000 burials in this cemetery interred in just a 20 year period. And many of the individuals were children, infants and children. There was a very high mortality rate among the formerly enslaved in that critical transition period from slavery uh, through emancipation and then freedom as they were trying to get their legs under them and become part of the capitalist system as individuals as opposed to enslaved. So um, the developer 
essentially gave the property to the city. And the city decided to turn it into a park. So uh, to do that, they had to grade the property quite a bit because of the slope that I mentioned before. And we, we can go back and I can show you. So the property started out as not very slopey at Adams Mill Road, but as you go north towards the creek, the slope increases incredibly. So how do you get a soccer field on a slope? Well, you have to grade the soil and take away from the high end and smudge it on the lower end. And that's exactly what they did. And so this map is a cut and fill analysis using GIS. It took those 1888 topographic contours that we saw on that um, earlier map, and it compares them to the current topographic contours. And then it, it does some algebra and um, it can tell you where there has been cutting, which are these darker colors, and then filling. Now this area with pink was on the slope going down to the creek, but it is now 12 meters filled. Okay, that's not feet, that's nearly 36 feet of fill. So they took all the high points off this property to create the soccer field and smudged it over here. And the dog park is essentially on this moved earth. Now, why is that archeology span and why is that important? Well, because this is a former cemetery and we consider it an archeological property. It is important. There's no one else in the district who, um, who can handle this. It's a, it's a significant archeological resources associated with significant time period and people in the past. And we don't want parks and rec to come in here and disturb any burial. So any work that goes on there, that goes on in this park now, where there's ground disturbance involved, we'll review it, we'll work with parks and recreation to define an archeological plan to avoid working in areas where they might encounter burials. So we might have monitoring, we might have testing out there, um, we might have ground penetrating radar. So as you can see where the park here on the south side has a kiddie playground, this is a very dark blue area. Uh, so over three meters of fill was removed there. Now, typical burial in a modern cemetery would be six feet below ground surface. That's about two meters. So the grading that took place in this area was uh, over a meter or three feet deeper than you would likely expect burials. Now, we don't trust this necessarily. It has to be ground truth. And so as the Parks and Rec has gone in to do amenities, to update the kiddie playground, they're creating a memorial to this cemetery. Um, and water lines and utilities. We've had archaeologists monitor that work and document exactly how much fill is in there. So we have the desktop version of what we think based on historic maps and GIS. And then we also ground truth that information so that we have that going forward. We have a better idea and can better manage this park and protect the resources there. Anyway, I mentioned geoarchaeology, and this is the process of taking cores or evaluating a, a, a unit or a hole in the ground, basically, for the soil types. And it's, uh, the geoarchaeology comes from geomorphology and archaeology, where it's morphed, <laughs> uh, merged together. And this is the geoarchaeologist on the far right. He pulled a, a core from the ground using a hand auger, and this is in Palisades Park. And you can see the soils from the bottom to top are deeper to shallower. And you get the bright orange soil at the top, a brownish darker layer in the middle, and then more tan colored soils below. And this is a really useful tool for us to identify the soil strata before we require a project. So if Parks and Rec is coming in and they wanna put 
you know, a new fence around a kiddie playground. We wouldn't necessarily have to have a full project if we can do geoarchaeology and know that there might be three or four feet of fill on a park. So this is part of the ground truthing I mentioned. And these are cores from a couple of different projects to give you an idea how that works. And then the, the value and importance of this is shown in this excavation unit at Fort Grable Park. Um, this is a park on the east side of the Anacostia River, uh, not far from uh, Bowling Air Force Base and Blue Plains in the capital um, or Congress Heights area. And it sits on the bluff overlooking the Potomac River. It was uh, a Civil War fort. Fort Grable was a Civil War fort. And this is the city park next to the earthworks that remain of that Civil War fort. And because the area is on a bluff and there was slope to the ground, in order to create the city playground, they ended up adding a lot of fill. And this particular project at Fort Grable, they were building a splash pad and building big fancy park amenities that were grow going to require foundations more than three feet deep. So we had them do some fairly deep testing. And it's a good thing because when the geoarchaeologists came out and did the course, they identified that there was a thick layer of fill before you got to this dark brown surface which is the living surface. That was the ground surface after the Civil War. And this little object in the photo is a, a blue pharmaceutical bottle in the wall of the unit. So the geoarchaeology helped us determine that there is a buried surface, a historical surface, essentially a site that was buried under a sufficient amount of fill to protect it, but would also be disturbed by the project. So they had to dig deeper here and do archeology span um, to get down to that level and make sure that the site, um, do, they, they dug down deeper to identify and evaluate the site and determine if it is a significant site or eligible for the National Register. That's the language of historic preservation and have to throw that out there. Um, that is the realm in which I work. <laughs> or is it an eligible site? Is it significant? Will it be disturbed? Can we avoid it? So all of these projects all over the city, whether they're eligible or not, whether they're on private property or public, whether they're permitted or not, they generate a huge amount of collections artifacts, documentation. So it's the paradox of abundance because when you dig a site, you destroy it. That whole, we looked at that square excavation unit, that site was the, the, the intact deposits in that location where they dug were destroyed. What remains are the records, the photographs, the documentation, and the artifacts. So it is very important in archeology span to preserve those data, that information for the future so that people can come back and look at it later and be able to make new interpretations or understand an aspect of history that they weren't interested in earlier. So we have an amazing abundance of resources here. Native American sites. I mentioned the rivers and that the, the location was hot, hot, hot for Native American occupations. Well, that means there are artifacts from these remaining sites, whether it's pottery, and this is decorated pottery, and this is a clay. It's, remember silly putty? You use silly putty and you can take a reverse image. And so this pottery was decorated with fabric. So even though it's just a pot shirt, Fabric rarely survives in the archaeological record around here because the soils are so acidic. And this is really sort of an added benefit. You have a sherd for cooking, but it also preserves an image of the kinds of fabrics people were making. We have a stone tool. We have a fossil shark's tooth that was perforated. It could have been worn as a pendant. It could have been hafted as a tool. 
So they're examples of Native American artifacts, but we also have other kinds of historic sites. This one is a bottle dump where these bottles were buried and they're bottles that would have been able, that would, were marked for uh, deposits. So I don't know if any of you remember when you would pay an extra nickel for a quarter on a product that you would buy in a bottle, and then you could go back with the empty bottle and get your nickel or your quarter back. So when this deposit was discovered, they're trying to make um, heads or tails of it and understand why was this huge pile of bottles buried in a pit in this yard. And essentially, they finally determined it was a savings account. They did some oral history and they understood that people would do that. And if you needed a few dollars for an emergency, you could go to your bottle stash and take those bottles to the corner store and get cash back. Uh, and think about that, living on the edge like that, where this is your savings account. So again, we're telling stories with this information about people who aren't in the documentary record, right? Um, this bottom image is of a um, pottery. They're wasters from a former stoneware kiln site that was in the Chinatown neighborhood where they were making these stoneware crocks. And stoneware is a really nice, robust, historic ceramic, and it doesn't use lead for the glaze. And it's also impervious to water intrusions. So you can store things like sauerkraut in it without giving your family lead poisoning. So it's a very important, durable uh, ceramic that was used for many purposes. And it was made right in the downtown neighborhood. And finally, this is the, the image on the far right shows an iron coffin. It's a mummy style coffin from the pre-Civil War period that was found between two apartment buildings. And, you know, why? Why is this there? And it turned out that uh, a cemetery had been moved once or twice. And in the process, the documents weren't very well organized and they lost track of one of the burials. And so even though these multi-story giant apartment buildings were built, in the 1930s and 40s, a coffin was left behind and they were doing gas utility work and they discovered it. It took a lot of research. An intern at the Smithsonian was finally able to put the picture together of why this abandoned coffin was there. It's an absolutely fascinating story. The Boy in the Iron Coffin, you can uh, Google that and there's some information on that by the Smithsonian on the internet. Anyway, I like to say, you never know what you're going to find in the district. It's always interesting. Well, this paradox of abundance takes us to the actual collections management and curation. And we've been working on this for years. We have a database and we've try we're trying to incorporate photographs of our objects and artifacts in it. We use it to... Um, record the locations where the collections are stored, what the collections are comprised of to manage the photos and the documentary materials. It is a lot of work and uh, Chrissy has been working on that as a, as a contractor with our office for eight years. Um, it's thankless in a way, and we continue to generate new collections every time there's a new project. So we're required by law to curate these materials in perpetuity. So um, we, for years, had been suffering a curation crisis. We had no facility to store these collections in. So we had them stored in our office. You can see cube land here with boxes. Um, and there was no database saying where these collections were. So since 2007, we've been working on 
identifying where all the collections are from all the projects in the district, getting them documented and getting them into our database. We've rescued some and others are still waiting out there to be found. Um, not all of them are technically our responsibility for curation, but because they're integral to telling these stories about the past, we're trying to locate them and whoever owns them to, to help those owners curate them properly. GSA and other federal agencies. Uh, okay, so our collections crisis, no facility, no database. We've been working on this for years. And finally, I can say we're making progress. Last year, the very end of 2021, we started moving some of our collections into our new facility. It's located within the archives space at the Martin Luther King Memorial Library. And I'm so excited about this. The library is a national um, registered listed property. It's a landmark. And they added three floors onto it and, do a, and did quite a bit of renovation. Now, because it's a landmark property, adding stories onto it was considered an adverse effect. And again, that's uh, written in the law. That's language from the law, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act. And to mitigate the adverse effects of this uh, renovation project, they had to come up with ways to add or create material or some other lasting effort to, to make up for the damage they did to that landmark. So their mitigation, major mitigation for this uh, renovation project at the library was to give us in perpetuity part of their curation space for the archeological collections. Um, sadly, the archivist there was the last to know he was losing some of the curation space uh, and was having to share it with us, but it all worked out and we've been in the process of reboxing and rehousing and updating our database and moving these boxes of artifacts into this space. We have roughly a thousand boxes and uh, it's gonna take us several years to complete the process. So um, this is in our office, in our national, uh, in our file room, collections stored on top of filing cabinets, cube land, collections stored on top of lateral files. Um, and this is the work of going through and in making sure there are lists in the boxes, that each box is in the database, the, the what's inside the box is in the database so that we can find things in the future. And it's a whole process of paperwork. We've been assisted with by interns and volunteers. Um, it is kind of thankless. Um, and the materials need to be housed in archival packaging, acid-free paper and boxes and bags and acid-free tags. It's a, it's a very detailed process. And what we do with that information is we update our database. You can see an accession number and a box number where it came from. There's many different layers to this database, the conditions assessments, the future work that's required on this, where it's stored, uh, lots and lots of information. And one of the pieces of this collections project is we ended up having to rescue some collections that were stored in, uh, that were privately stored that um, were going to be discarded or they were in the danger of being discarded. They're orphans. So the Forest Marbury House, the developer, renovated this house back in the early 80s. And it is now, you can see the flag, it's the Ukrainian embassy. It's a very rich project. This is one of the earliest houses in Georgetown. But the developer took the project, uh, took the collections generated by the project, built shelving in his garage, and it was there for 15, 20 years, and called us when they were getting ready, when he and his wife were getting ready to downsize and retire and said, can we have our garage back? So we 
took the collection from them. They did a deed of gift to us. And we brought the boxes to the back to the office and they were a mess. You can see blah. And there were rodent nests in the boxes. The, they were nice, cozy places in a cold winter for rodents to make a cozy nest. And we used volunteers and summer youth interns. And the minimum that we could do was to get them in clean new boxes, clean the bags, re rehouse everything, and bring it up to that minimum standard. Uh, so that is one success story. We protected this collection. A second one is the housing house, a similar Georgetown project, a, a landmark property, but it was a private owner. And uh, the work that was done on that property in the 80s, the archaeologists and the owner got into a bit of a scuffle about payments and a report was never written and he took the collections back. And this is what they look like. The boxes were stacked up, they were crushed, there were newspaper, it was a mess. So again, we rescued this collection when he uh, was about to sell the property. And here it is in our office, neatly rehoused and reboxed, again, with the help of interns and laborers, we uh, volunteers. We could not do our work without them. From grad students that are working on our collections, to volunteers. Uh, many of you may know Bob Sonderman, a retired Park Service archaeologist. He's teaching our interns and volunteers about how to date bottle glass. We have, we use grad students to help us with our work through our internship program. And we have a number of grad students right now that are using these collections for theses and dissertations. Dr. Um, Mia Carey used the Yarrow Mammut Project for her dissertation at the University of Florida. Nikki Grieg is using the Shotgun House collection for her dissertation at, and already her masters at University of Chicago. And Jen Lupu is using the Housing House for her dissertation at Northwestern. So this is a really exciting way for us to get reports written for these collections that were orphaned. Our current interns down here, Nicole DeWitt and London Booker, University of Maryland students, and they're doing collections with us. And our stalwart volunteer, Lois Berkowitz, has helped us for years with our collections work. Finally, the other thing we do in the office is community-based archaeology. Um, we've done some of our own projects, uh, and that is through the efforts of DC Preservation League and the Historic Preservation Board pressuring the board to require this work be done. That's usually outside their purview. Um, I don't want to go into details of why these projects were required, but uh, suffice to say, we've done two large projects pro bono on private property where we would not normally have been able to do archaeology at all because there was no legal hook. The board mandated that the development could not go forward and the renovations or demolition of historic properties could not occur until archaeology was examined. And so we did one at the Yarrow Mammut Project in Upper Georgetown and one at the Shotgun House in Capitol Hill. And they're both important because of the things we learned. Uh, not only did we benefit ourselves by working with the public on these projects, but we learned so much about individuals that escaped the historical record. Yarrow Mammut, and this is a painting of him by Charles Wilson Peel, was a formerly enslaved African Muslim who managed to buy a property in Upper Georgetown. The shotgun house was we had no idea was built by German immigrants in the 1830s to 1850s and was in the core of a German immigrant community. We had no idea. So these projects are um, allowing us to dig deeper into the history and tell stories about these people that just were totally overlooked by the historical record. In Yarrow, we were able to leverage uh, pro bono work by geoarchaeologists 
people that do ground penetrating radar. We had our interns do historic um, map research and work. Um, volunteer retired archaeologists came out with their equipment and their knowledge and helped us run this project. It took, period, took place over a period of six months, generated thousands of artifacts. And um, this picture on the lower right shows what crazy things people do to their property. This is over three feet of fill layers, including coal ash. Where did it come from? Why is it there? When did it get deposited? I mean, still questions that we're wrestling with. Um, it is an amazing project. We got to work with the Muslim community. We built um, bridges across continents uh, because there were um, several imams were visiting the district from Africa and came out and did a prayer for Yara Mahmoud, who was reputed to have been buried on this property. Now, we never found evidence of him. And I blame that on the in the ground pool in the middle of the property. But the fact that we looked and the information we generated, it just it makes a richer picture of history in the district that we just would not have otherwise. It was an award-winning project and really benefited from a group of dedicated volunteers from many different walks of life with many different skill sets. <clears throat> Finally, <clears throat> the shotgun house. Um, why was there a shotgun house in, in Capitol Hill? You know, who built it? Why was it there? And that was one of our, um, two of our hypotheses or actually research questions that when we went into the project and we, same thing, leverage volunteers. Uh, we did not bring a backhoe in for this one because it turns out the deposits are very shallow. You can see this is a shovel test through a concrete slab where there used to be a garage and there's a fill layer, but beneath the fill, we hit pay dirt. There is a really wonderful trash deposit. It was in the backyard underneath that garage before the garage went in. And we spent many months out there. And it turns out that underneath the shotgun house itself, and, and here it is, the building's been removed there was a former cold cellar. And then once we realized what was going on and that the house was built by German immigrants and for almost a hundred years was occupied by German immigrants and their descendants, the cold cellar and the bottle deposits, the beer culture of, of Germany, uh, it just all fit together to create a picture of immigrant life in Capitol Hill. <clears throat> We've used these projects to fuel our education and outreach efforts, and we also participate in the Day of Archaeology Festival and other events around the city. If you book us, we will come. We'll visit your classroom. We'll come out to your events, um, and we can bring activities geared to different levels. We have a teaching trunk with wonderful Native American reproduction materials that we'll bring there's lots of different things we can do. And again, volunteers and interns are our lifeblood in this effort. <clears throat> now, if you're interested more in what we've learned about archaeology in the district, in 2003, this website was top of the pops. And you can Google DC archaeology tour. The, the, this website, Washington Underground, is maintained by the University of Maryland's uh, History and Heritage Program. Um, and that's a, a, a web link to it. There's also a brochure. The Park Service put this together with our help in 2003. We're in the process of converting it to a story map, a GIS story map, but that won't be ready for a while yet. But, um, and that's the trick of all of this. You generate brochures. Nobody wants paper anymore. You create a website. It's out of date. We'll create a GIS story map, and someday that'll be toast. So, these materials and the information and the data have to be constantly updated. We have projects where the information's on floppy disks. Some of you may not even know what a floppy disk is. So it's the technology is a boon and a benefit, but it also, um, it's a historic artifact like anything else. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up here. 
Um, please remember to save the past for the future and help us protect the district's archaeological resources. Remember that looting, especially on federal or district property, is a crime. You know, the artifacts right now may be in cur our curation facility, but one of the things we're going to do is get the catalog online for people to be able to access it. And just to let you know, the Art Day of Archaeology Festival will be June 10th at Dumbarton House. Bring the kids, bring the grandkids, bring your neighbor's kids. Um, it's activities for adults and kids and focuses on the district's archaeological collections and activities related to them, but all the other archaeology groups in the region, Alexandria Archaeology, Fairfax County, Mount Vernon, Monticello. Um, it's a big archaeology network meeting too. So please come out and um, do follow us on Facebook. Um, you can reach us uh, actually, email is the easiest. Um, you can reach both Christine and I that way. All right. Well, thank you. And now's the time when you get to ask your questions. And I'll turn it over to you, Shay. Yes. So we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one is, how do you know uh, when doing a dig or an investigation uh, what to remove and store and what to leave in place if you leave things there? Well, we do leave things in place. Uh, if you if a project is not going to uh, damage a, a part of an archaeological site, we, we try to avoid it and leave it intact in place. Um, but it really, it depends on what's going on. Now, as to what we keep you know, where we excavate will be the artifacts that we would keep, um, that we would analyze and curate. Um, but it really is a project by project basis and you go back and forth. It's called a consultation project. So Parks and Recs, they may say, we want a dog park here. And we're like, you can't. And they're like, why not? And how can, and we'll tell them, well, can we avoid this sensitive area? And that avoidance can take place in a number of ways. Maybe we only um, install, let's say, the dog park fence by drilling without digging fence post holes in area, in soils that we already know are filled. There's uh, many different ways to do that. And it really is a project by project basis. Sometimes you put it this site, you leave a site intact in green space. Uh, sometimes you bury it with a cap of fill to protect it. It they're just um, it, it is essentially open ended. Very interesting. <laughs> what are the main federal requirements for archives and uh, storage facilities? For archaeology, there's uh, federal regulations that are codified in 36 CFR 79, and that, that defines what a curation facility would be, and um, <clears throat> fortunately, <laughs> excuse me, fortunately for us, the uh, archaeological arch uh, curation facility uh, regulations are also uh, consistent with what National Archives requires for a library archive. That's why we were able to share the space with the um, DC Public Library's archives. It has to do with climate control, keeping steady humidity and temperature because it's the big fluctuations that will deteriorate paper and artifacts. When uh, you may have seen um, a a piece of pottery or broken ceramic or even a brick in your yard, if it's subject to constant frost three, a freeze in the winter, it will start to break apart. The water seeps in and, and when it freezes, the ice crystals expand and, and will fracture it. So any kind of temperature fluctuation is bad. It's important to keep the humidity steady. The other important thing is to manage pests. Cockroaches, right? Silverfish that eat paper, moths that will deteriorate any kind of fabric remains. Um, the packaging has to be archival paper, 
buffered paper or coroplast, that sort of corrugated plastic, these things are stable. You want to have fire suppression that's um, that will come on automatically. So things, if there's a fire, you know, that that's really bad. Um, and limited access and and there's the, a whole series of things that are were required to do for that and fortunately um, the public library was already doing most of those things for their space and so we are riding their coattails on that and i have to say we are thrilled at it yeah it's really exciting uh and such a great space that they've created there as well for the community. Um, I think those were our main questions from the audience, but uh, I'll ask you kind of a fun question to kind of wrap up <laughs> our webinar, but uh, do you have a favorite artifact, DC artifact? Oh gosh, um, uh, that changes from day to day. <laughs> and um, it's, it, it changes based on my mood or what I've seen <laughs> recently. But right now, my favorite artifact is a, a frozen Charlotte doll. It's a, a little miniature. It was a, a porcelain doll, maybe two inches tall. And the one I'm thinking of was found on a site at, at Fifth and I on some district owned property, part of the midden. And um, it indicates that children probably played there. Um, and that artifact is a favorite because we had it 3D scanned by um, the um, Virginia Commonwealth University Virtual Curation Lab, where they use undergraduates to do archaeological collections work. So we, uh, we have a number of those 3D printed, and we can use them for outreach. And I was uh, holding one of their 3D prints yesterday, which is why it's my current favorite. But the, the Frozen Charlotte doll, this little tiny porcelain doll, there's a story behind it. And she's called Frozen Charlotte because there's a folk song about a, a young woman who went to a ball and she had a fancy dress. And this would have been in the 1830s or 1850s. And um, she was so vain, she didn't want to ruin her dress. So she was in uh, New England and rode to the ball without a cloak. And it was a New Year's ball and she froze to death. <laughs> so there's a folk poem and a song and these little frozen Charlotte dolls, the story goes, is that you would freeze them and then when you would have a tea party or your afternoon tea, you would drop the frozen doll in to cool your tea for children, that, that kind of thing. So it's uh, this little innocuous doll, crazy folk song that's <laughs> kind of graphic and um, an artifact we found in the district. Yeah, I love that. It's such a great, great story and so, so interesting. And it's cool that um, the three D printing is being used for artifacts uh, too. That's really interesting. Well, you know, the what they're doing at, at VCU um, is really amazing. When three D printing first started, I was like, "What are we ever going to do with that?" You yeah. know, I was very skeptical. But they're doing amazing things, and with these the artifacts because you can print them and you can also make plaques for them and bases mm -hmm. and things. One of the things they've been able to do is create artifact prints with braille. So they'll, they'll mount, they'll incorporate a plaque on the back of the artifact with braille text describing what the artifact is. And, you know, generally you don't allow people to touch or handle artifacts because the oils and things can deteriorate the surface or if they're painted or whatever. But then this allows the blind to feel the shape, even if it's not yeah. the original ceramic, and then read the text to explain that. So think about the power of an artifact to tell a story and to get that story to people that can't see. So, I mean, it's it's really an amazing way to leverage archeology span and make it accessible to the blind. Yeah, absolutely, that's amazing. 
Well, thank you so much uh, for, for talking to us today. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure everybody else did as well. And uh, I will send it to you when it's up on YouTube. So I hope everybody has a great uh, rest of your day and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook. Yes. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.